Hello, hello, it's Joy Foster, founder of Tech Fixies and the host of the Sparkle and Thrive podcast. And I'm really excited about this series that we're running. We're doing a whole series on how to market different businesses. So we've already talked to uh, an underwear company. We've talked to a women's clothing company. And now we're going to shift gears and uh, go a little bit deeper into the travel industry. Uh, prior to this uh, interview, uh, I interviewed uh, the founder, well, not founder, but the CEO of Travel Counselors. And we talked all about what it's like to be a travel counselor. We also have women in our community uh, at Tech Pixies in our social media magic program who have Airbnbs. So they're Airbnb hosts or they run hotels. Uh, we've got the a wonderful woman named Yvonne who has been building up her hotel in Jamaica live on Instagram as uh, she's been doing her course, which has been a lot of fun. We've got a lot of jealous tech pixies who want to be in Jamaica right now with her and cannot wait till the travel restrictions end. Uh, what I wanted to do today though was bring on some experts absolute true champions in the Airbnb space to the extent that they've had news articles written about them that have been published in the paper. They were booked out all the time. So I want to get their tips and tricks on marketing an Airbnb. So welcome to the show, Lee J and Amanda. I'm so delighted that you're here. Uh, and give us a little bit of background, a little bit of history. Tell us about you and, and how you got into the Airbnb business. Fantastic. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah. First, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you, Joy, for inviting us over. Welcome. <laughs> um, so tell us how you got started. Where do we start? Where do we start? I, I, I guess um, Amanda and I have been together for about 15 years or so. And when we first got together, uh, I quickly realized that, that I was a very lucky man because Amanda is an amazing um, cook, chef, um, not via profession, but just very talented. And uh, I always said to Amanda, I said to her, you know, you should be your master chef. And um, uh, and then a couple of years in and a few bottles of wine one evening, all of a sudden I found Amanda, opened up the laptop and I said to Amanda, why don't you uh, enter MasterChef? And she did and got through to the quarterfinals. So uh, that sort of, that was the start of our, actually food is a real passion point and uh, coupled with going abroad often uh, or actually not even abroad here in the UK, taking um, cheeky trips to boutique hotels. And um, we realized that actually one day we'd love to run a boutique accommodation business coupled with my sort of jazz hands, front of house, candles and atmos, shall we call it, and Amanda's talent for food. And, and that's really where it all started. We quickly realized we were both passionate about travel, food, hotels, etc. Yeah. And I think just to give a bit of background, both of us come from a marketing background. So we've worked in various different roles in uh, media agencies, media owners and, and big platforms. And EJ worked at Facebook for many years and I'm sure we'll touch on that because it came in handy when marketing our own uh, business. But um, you talk with, you know, Airbnb, what a brilliant platform. Our first experience um, of, of, of launching on Airbnb was when we had our own flat in Wimbledon and um, obviously the tennis championship happened every summer and uh, it was a great opportunity to uh, generate some more revenue. We had a, a, a spare room and we decided, right, let's rent out our room uh, while the Wimbledon championships were on. So we did that. We did. Uh, and we had some incredible guests, one of whom I think was one of the uh, original kind of leaders at Airbnb. Yes, he was. <laughs> yes, he was. And he came to stay and we were like, oh, my God, OK, like we need to get you know, brush our socks up. We're going to have to do breakfast for him and yeah. make sure the experience is incredible. Um, and he absolutely loved uh, his stay with us. And we became really good friends. And you you still are in touch with him now. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, really, that was our first experience, I suppose, of hosting people, yeah. uh, the art of hospitality, and really um, helped us almost just sort of solidify in our, in our own minds. This is really something we want to do. So fast forward a few years later, uh, we uh, ended up buying a, a barn in the middle of Herefordshire in the, the Malvern Hills, uh, 9,000 square foot, 12 acres. And <laughs> we spent about two years renovating it. 
plotting and planning, you know, what this vision for what would become the bullshed. Um, and we had lots of fun brainstorming the name, as you can imagine. Yeah, I love that name. So the bullshed is what it was called. Yeah. yeah. We, we nearly, although Amanda skipped a little bit here, depending on how much of the full story you and your uh, uh, community. We like the whole story, yeah. Lee. Yeah. Lee, 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 so there's a few bits and pieces that we, we Amanda seemed to have missed there, such as we spent about a year um, traveling from London to Italy um, almost okay. every single month because we got married in Italy. And we, of course, love Italian food, wine and weather and the people. And um, we, we at least a year we were going to and from um, sort of central Italy over to sort of Tuscany, northern Umbria, traveling the countryside, seeing many, many rusticas um, that we thought actually we'd love to, you know, sort of renovate completely and, and set up over there. Um, after about a year, we kind of came to our senses and realised actually we probably haven't got the um, <laughs> what's the <Right>. word? <laughs> I don't, don't don't think my nerves could have taken it to be brutally honest with you. So uh, our Italian was coming along, but it still wasn't fluent enough. So we thought actually let's try it in the UK. Um, so. Yeah, I think launching your own business is tough enough when you're doing it in a in a market you don't speak the language. I was learning. Uh, I was going to classes once a week, but yeah, trying to get your head around the laws and the logistics and sort of quite complex, fairly debatable kind of areas in Italian law. I was a bit like, oh, maybe we should try this in the UK yeah. first. Well, um, that's so interesting that you say that because my... Um, my mom's partner who's been in my life for you know i mean yeah. nearly two decades now uh yeah. he did do that 40 or 50 years ago they went and they renovated a borgo in italy so yeah. at the top of this hill but they don't it's it's only private use and it's only for them yeah. but just the politics around that was huge and i right. had a girlfriend who wanted to go and renovate that you know a, a home in italy and i just i, I warned her let me yes. just say I warned her. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. You've got to have nerves of steel for that kind of stuff. Um, you know, there was a lot of grey, shall we say, when we, we, we actually found a beautiful, beautiful property uh, that was scary to look at and, and, and think of the amount of work that needed doing. But um, and we got hugely excited about it. But when we started getting down to the nuts and bolts, there was an awful lot of grey that could have taken us financially into a whole different level of pain to be honest that we weren't prepared to go down <laughs> so, um, but nevertheless we came back to yeah we did as Amanda said you know once we'd sort of said actually let's let's give this a go in the UK uh, then for us it was a matter of identifying okay there's there's beautiful properties all over the world here in the UK and all over the world so how are we going to stand out what makes us different from perhaps our competitors there and that was really important and I'm um, you know, we're both passionate about beautiful properties and, and so on. We'd, um, we'd renovated a few properties ourselves and come from homes where our very lucky our parents sort of loved our, loved maintaining a beautiful home and so on. So we had an e element of interior. I can bring you a beautiful home behind That's very kind. That's very kind. It's a bit windy out there, but it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a lovely day here. So it's all good. Um, but we found we were very lucky. And again, we sort of traveled the UK trying to find uh, a building that had a little bit of something different about it. And we stumbled across this fantastic, uh, as Amanda mentioned before, red brick barn, um, which was early 1800s um, next door to a, a beautiful Tudor house that used to be the Bishop of Hereford's hunting lodge, as you do. And um, this gigantic barn needed extensive renovation uh, work to it to make it truly habitable and a beautiful property but it was exceptionally handsome the the brickwork itself and everything was very imposing and it overlooked the Morgan Hills so I knew when I looked at that I thought you know it's a it's a bit of a blank, blank canvas I know what needs to be done here um, and I knew that that beautiful barn coupled with Amanda's amazing talent for food uh, and my eye for uh, candles, Atmos, and opening a fantastic bottle of wine for my guests, hopefully would deliver something of uh, oh, wow there factor. We uh, oh, there we go, Joy. <laughs> yeah, so for those of you who are watching live on, on Facebook, we've got actually the, the montage of images uh, showing. But you're right, it is absolutely stunning. 
Yeah. Um, and it's just incredible. So tell us how you were able to turn this into something that people could stay in and rent from and actually how you started really getting recognized for what you were doing. Great yeah. question. Um, so I suppose obviously the first thing was getting the property um, kind of where we wanted it to be. And, and that was very much your kind yes. of vision, I suppose. So as, as I said before, we spent two years renovating um, and we started we started small so we kind of renovated one section of the barn which enabled us to have two bedrooms to start with that we could start um, marketing uh, and renting out um, to our guests and we initially did that through Airbnb I think but I suppose before all of that we did so much to kind of set the vision, the brand, what was the kind of ethos that we wanted to portray, what was the experience that we wanted our guests to have. And all of that was, I suppose, a catalyst of ideas that we'd had for so many years as we, we built towards this vision and dream. Um, uh, the, the bit we didn't mention in our story was a week after we moved into the barn, I found out I was pregnant. Yes. yes <laughs> so it was like a classic episode of, you know, um, grand designs. It was just like, Sarah okay, Beanies. here we yeah. go. You know, just about to embark on a big renovation project and take on the biggest things of our lives. Yeah. So um, I actually spent most of my maternity leave because while we were doing this project, this was our side hustle. We still had full time jobs. Uh, in London so we were commuting to London four days a week coming back to the barn at the weekends overseeing the renovations wow it was actually only when I went off on mat leave I was like right I need to build a website get our social media up and running get a logo build a sign right it was just like I just kind of went into crazy overdrive in terms of getting our proposition ready because I knew that we wanted to open, um, yeah, sort of pretty soon um, uh, after that period. So, yeah, so at the start was, yeah, kind of building our brand and identity. And actually, this is where social media came into its own and using our own network. So uh, we, I remember we posted a, a post to go, right, we need someone to help us build a logo because it was like, that's where we started. We had the name, we had the vision, right? We're not graphic designers. Let's build a logo. So we reached out and a friend's, a friend of a friend's My husband. My old boss, actually. Yeah, yeah. Your My, old boss. Now, My old boss at Virgin Radio, uh, her, her husband, Lee, um, said, yeah, you know, I do all this all the time. I'd, I'd be more than happy to uh, do a logo for you and so on. And, and Amanda had already pulled together sort of what she wanted more or less, which was fab. And then Lee just sort of made it come to come to light. Yeah, it? did all the, the kind of technical stuff that, you know, would have taken me ages to do on my own. Um, and which, which social media network did you end up going with first? Um, well, I think for that particular one, it was just a matter of us posting for our friends through our friends on Facebook. Oh yeah, no, but when you set up your Insta, when you set up your not Instagram, but when you set up your social media accounts, um, yeah. which one did you like? Which one did you focus on the most? F Facebook. Yeah, I think we. I think to be honest with you, rather than going for one, um, we went for Facebook and Instagram at the same time. Yeah. Um, because to be brutally honest with you. Um, most people use both, but they just use them slightly differently. And, and, so, and now we got to remind the viewers that you actually are a Facebook. You were a uh, Facebook yeah. employee. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to sound like I'm selling Facebook. And no, the, well, uh, we love, I mean we love Facebook here at Tech Fixies. Yeah. So you know, yeah. the, Tech Fixies has been built on Facebook quite literally. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm not I'm not an anti Facebook person. Um, but what I, and I know it's a little bit like being a banker, right? You got to be like, I work for Facebook, but. Um, yeah. and good so, news, I don't work anymore, so I can be fairly free in my speech. But yeah. um, but in the grand scheme of things, and I, I always, I, in fact, I've got dear friends at this moment in time are over at the, um, uh, over in Levy, um, and they've built a, a fantastic boutique um, B and B, so so that uh, guests can come and stay in the Northern Lights and so on, uh, and watch the Northern Lights. And, oh, uh, and I want to hear about that too. <laughs> yeah, really good. But I was I was saying to Paul and Aggie, his other half, 
just the other week, I said, if you can design, you know, Instagram's obviously a beautiful, beautiful platform. So if you can design your photos and your posts for Instagram, and of course, it's so easy to share it then across to your Facebook page as well, you'll capture everybody in the grand scheme of things. Design for, design for Instagram, and it will stand out beautifully on Facebook. So mm. if you do that, um, that, that without question is the way forward. But, but when we were thinking, when we were... When we were trying to uh, achieve guests to our BNB in those early stages, it was as much about Facebook, Instagram, and of course, Airbnb and making sure that mm. our profile on Airbnb, and particularly in the early days for the rooms. In fact, I think we didn't even have a website in those early, very, very early days, because as Amanda said, you know, I think had we had Leo or we were just about to have Leo and Amanda was juggling things and so on. So it was a matter of Airbnb can be our test. We'll pop yeah. a Facebook and Instagram page up and running and we'll get to the website as soon as possible, which Amanda did amazingly whilst looking after Leo as well, I mm -hmm. think, wasn't it? But, but yeah, that, I think that's an important point though for a lot of people to know that yeah. in today's world of technology, you can start on social media and yeah. then you can leverage already existing platforms yeah. like Airbnb to you know to test out the idea without having to go all the way to creating your own website and yeah. you know right. and, and so oh, well, Came, our, yeah, our um, website came later. We used Airbnb, as Lee J said, Facebook, TripAdvisor. We set up, you know, a page on that. We really wanted to kind of capture our guests' experience in those early days. Is early days we knew that having, yeah, having good kind of reviews um, and those testimonials was really important. Um, yeah, as important to be honest with you, you know, and and you say early days actually just throughout the whole lot. We were very lucky that we have five out of five star reviews for every single guest that ever stayed there. And actually in the, in, then a couple of years on, as people like the Sunday Times then started to discover us, um, in addition to coming and doing their own research, of course, as you would expect, they, it was so important for them to look at those reviews and sort of say, look, your, your guests are wax lyrical about you and what you're producing here. And so therefore we have confidence in putting you in the top 100 hotels in the country or top, be the best B&B in the country as we... What accoladed further down mm. there. Further well, that, down. this is a great point because a lot of people would love to know the tips and tricks to getting five star reviews. I mean, it sounds like a huge part of your strategy was having a really clear vision for what you wanted yeah. and then just over delivering in terms of the quality and the experience that they had. Yeah. Uh, is that what it boiled down to, or was there another, um, another, are there some other tips and tricks you can tell us to getting a five star review? Yeah. Yeah, I think for us, it was. Absolutely, all about delivering that experience that we set out to to to, to create, and that centered around you know amazing food, the most comfortable bed you've ever slept in. You know, for us, it was like bed and breakfast. They're the two most important things: an amazing bed and amazing breakfast. So we kind of started there, and everything else followed. But it was all around following the things that were that we're passionate about. So sourcing local food only using local suppliers and really making sure that that was an integral part of the whole experience um making sure that when people came to stay that they just they felt at home you know we kind of pitched ourselves almost like a home from home it was you're coming to stay in a beautiful environment but there's no pretense, you know, if you want to walk around in your pajamas and your slippers, that's fine. Leech, we're going to fetch you a gin tonic <laughs> and light the fire. So it was very much like we were living and breathing the arts of hospitality, but it was how did we translate that then to reach new audiences through social media, but also, yeah, ensuring that our guests shared that experience. So we were quite open about asking people to leave a review, and I'd say to any of your you know, kind of community if they're running business, don't be afraid to ask for feedback, you know, and, and encourage people to do that because a lot of our guests were more than happy to do that. Mm. Um, well, it it's really interesting because we have a student um, who's actually set up a ukulele boot camp uh, so people can learn how to play the ukulele in a week. It's a really fun experience. And for a lot of people in lockdown, it's been immensely useful to learn how to play an instrument. And uh, interestingly enough, they were they're 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 launching again right now, and you know another boot camp, and they sent out an email to their list, which has grown quite a bit over the last couple months because they've been building this boot camp. And they said, "Hey guys, 
we really need your help. You know, go and if you enjoyed your experience, go onto Facebook and drop in a five star review. So um, overnight, they got 19 five star reviews, beautiful testimonials about what they did. They were able to turn that and craft that into emails to help promote the boot camp. And yeah. you know, I think if people, if you ask people, you know, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. But if you ask people, you might get, you might just be surprised at what comes through. We had another student, and both of you are on LinkedIn. Um, but we had another student who um, her primary audience is on LinkedIn. So obviously what happens in our program is we teach all the different networks and then so we teach the four major networks plus Pinterest. So um, Facebook and um, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and then we also teach uh, Pinterest. And then what we're trying to do is help them navigate. OK, now that you understand all five of these, which, you know, two or three are you going to leverage for you? And so we have one gal who um, does uh, training in the the home um, space, but it's more in the homelessness space. So helping uh, councils and uh, different organizations uh, combat homelessness. So she's got a she's got a program on that that she teaches. And so what she did was very similar. She she just made it her mission. She was going to ask a uh, hundred people for a recommendation. And again, overnight, she got fifteen recommendations. And she she posted one of them in the group, and she was just teary eyed because it was so. It was such an endorsement of who she was and what she was doing. And now it's all over her LinkedIn page, right? Because someone else in the industry who is well reputable, you know, is with reputable commented on her stuff. So I think you're right. Maybe the you know number one best ex best thing to do is give them the best experience possible. Uh, number two is then ask for the review, because if you don't ask for the review, you're not going to get them. Yeah, I think I think the thing I'd add to this conversation, though, and it's an well, I hope this is an important point, but it's around managing people's expectations, both in terms of when you go onto the website, try and be as clear as possible of what you're going to provide. And equally, then at the start of that journey, make sure they're, again, clear what you're just about to provide them with. Because, and, and, and I'll bring that to life a little bit. So the barn that we had created was also our home. It was our home in the week, the full extent of the barn. And then predominantly we ran the bullshed on a Friday, Saturday night, sometimes on a Thursday, depending. So it was a, a two or three nights a week sort of stay. And people could either book out the whole of the barn that would accommodate 10, 12 people, or they could book room by room. Now, we ran those. If they booked out the whole of the barn, we would operate, I'd often refer it to a bit like a ski chalet. So we're around, we own the barn. And in fact, that's an important point as well, because it's an owner run property. And if you make sure that people are really clear about that, they realize they haven't just kind of taken the whole rental and they can just go wild and wreck the place or, uh, you know, all those kind of things. We are going to come in. We have to come in and do your breakfast for you. We might, you know, we've got our team that will come and clean the rooms. We're going to be coming and doing the fire. Now, if you, First of all, make sure they know that upon booking, then you're managing expectations from the get go, because there could have been many, many different times where people are like, well, the owners keep coming through, don't they? You know, I thought we'd rented the whole house and, um, you know, we, were, we, we can't exactly go wild with the, the, the Sambuca shots, can we, with the owner coming through, you know? So, so and, and that therefore could have led to a really awkward, you know, you think that you've delivered the experience but the communication is really, really key. And I mean, at the start of it, and again, particularly for the whole house hires, which obviously is a, it was a good amount of money for us. It was, uh, uh, they, everybody got amazing value out of it. Amanda often would do a, a feasting night and so on. Um, uh, and it was a fantastic environment. But if you, you know, I kind of always, everybody would arrive and give them a glass of wine. And then I kind of do a house tour to make sure they knew what the rules of the house were. You know? <laughs> um, and that way they could see as well how much personal sort of um, pride had gone into creating the environment. So they were actually that much more careful about our property and what we were going to do. And in fact, they loved it. And back to Amanda's point before, they kind of felt like they were um, and we made them welcome. No, don't get me wrong. It wasn't like we were house masters all of a sudden, but um, they, everybody had a great time. They were always looked wax lyrical. They, mo a lot of people left like feeling they'd made friends. Um, the other art, of course, in hospitality is knowing those people that you think you can have a good chat with. And actually, those are frankly just come for a good break. So mm -hmm. they were and particularly with somebody like myself who's quite an extrovert you know i've i've learned over the years knowing when i think nine and a half times out of ten knowing 
when to give people that kind of pieces of insight or chat or um or back off and, and again all those things are, are quite important that's so can... interesting i i hadn't even really thought about that side of it we've only a couple of times we rented our house out um you know like when we've gone on holiday we just felt safer having someone in the house yeah. and yeah we've had mixed um mixed experiences you know and i think you're right that expectation and you know one of the things that we did change on our Airbnb listing was this is a family home. Like when we're, when we're not, when you're, when we're on holiday, you're moving into our family home. So, you know, expect photos and expect books and expect toys. Yeah. Um, you know, and we, you know, we cleaned it up as much as we could, but we had, um, and we did say on, we did say on one of the things we, and actually I then updated it. I said, you know, no, not suitable for infants or yeah. toddlers because we have older children. But it was really interesting because I had said that I'd said it wasn't suitable for toddlers or for children or for babies. And, you know, this these two couples came with their ba their brand new babies for a New Year's Eve. And um, suddenly I got all these messages going like you didn't dust underneath the bed and you didn't dust behind the bed. And I'm like, who dusts under the bed and who dusts behind the bed? And they're like, well, the infants. And I'm like, there there shouldn't be an infant there. <laughs> this, yeah. this isn't an infant house. So, um you know, I mean, yeah. and I never even dusted when I had an infant. So, you know, yeah. behind the bed or under the bed. So you do, have to, you do have to second guess, I think. Uh, and we were much the same because ours was a, quite a vast open bar with a number of places that technically were not really suitable for a, a, a child. So, again, yeah, we had to take that decision quite early on and work out who your audience, who's going to have the most appropriate time here really and who's going to enjoy the space who's going to enjoy the environment and so if we were if we were renting out room by room actually we would say absolutely no children at all because you know you may have one couple that hasn't got children who are coming for a relaxing break and doesn't really want as much as our property was we were lucky it was eight and a half thousand square foot so it's a large property um you know at the same time, we had a massive lounge where it would be cavernous and, you know, the echoing sound. So if you had a three, four, five year old running around, you've got this lovely couple that are trying to chill out. And then you've got another family over here. They're going to have two different experiences of what we were trying to provide there. Mm -hmm. So um, we had to make a call very early on. Unless you're taking the whole barn, there's absolutely no children allowed into um, the barn. Yeah. So understanding your audience, I think that's a key and thing. Yeah, and I guess building on that whole understanding your audience, when we set up, set up and launched, I think we had in our minds an idea of who our audience and our guests would be. And actually it evolved over time. And this is again where Facebook sort of came into its own from a marketing perspective, is we were getting a lot of inquiries for whole house rentals. We didn't really... We hadn't really thought about that as being a key market for us. We, we'd always sort of envisaged it being more room by room, B and B um, kind of accommodation. Um, but we quickly realised actually this private hire um, and accommodating groups, often who were coming to celebrate a birthday, and so we quickly honed in on kind of don't want the. 30, 40th birthdays because they <laughs> kind of crash the place. But actually, we've had some lovely guests who are kind of celebrating their 50th or their 60th. So um, Lee J being, you know, sort of clever marketeers <laughs> on Facebook, actually ran, we ran um, a campaign to target people who were kind of approaching their 50th or 60th birthday promoting the barn as an ideal sort of venue to for a celebration and actually that campaign generated a shed loads of bookings for us on that's it. amazing okay so now we got to go into this we got to go into this campaign because i know this is going to be great so i love this uh the, the idea of the parties uh you know and i know what you mean with the 30 and the 40s uh <laughs> <laughs> we we actually rented a, an Airbnb for my 40th because uh, I was doing the Ironman in Wales. And so I did tell them it is for my 40th birthday, but I'm doing the Ironman. So there's not going to be any partying. <laughs> yeah, that's, good. that's yeah. a good point. I mean, to be fair, we also thought to ourselves, well, we don't want hen do's and we don't want stag do's. But yeah. actually, we did take a couple of um, hen do's and 
we and particularly in the earlier days and actually they were lovely 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 girls we didn't take any stag do's i didn't want that <laughs> so, but we had the hen do's yeah. uh, yeah. and, and they were great and amanda sort of says the 40th we definitely had a 40th or two there um well but, tell us about this campaign for the 50s well, and 60s I, yeah i think i think what amanda sort of said there is it's is very true so we had identified that our property was that we had the ability to close a few doors and section it off and and so it was still one big property but we had the ability to give people a little bit more privacy of having a section of the property and that enabled us to sort of say hey look it's a, if it's a special occasion and obviously as Amanda says, 40th, 50th, 60th, 70th um, are special occasions. Um, come and take the barn, you know, you and you and nine of your friends um, or your members of family. And so through the use of Facebook, Instagram targeting, um, I started to land our content to 39 year olds, 49 year olds, 59 year olds, or actually, I think if I remember correctly, there's have you got a friend that's a friend or family member upcoming that's 39, 49, 59? And so we would then think, OK, let's take some beautiful photos of the table laid out um, for, dinner. for dinner for one of the feasting menus that Amanda can do or, or just use some of the existing materials that we had. You know, this is a great place to um, celebrate that big birthday event. And it worked superbly. It was a fantastic way of um, bringing in bookings to be British. And were, was it basically a conversion ad where you were collecting email addresses and then? Yeah, so interestingly, um, we had a lot of people that would either just go straight on to our, yes, is the answer, go onto the website and then sort of take booking, yes. Um, equally though, what was quite interesting um, is often you'd have, you'd get into the conversation when people would arrive and they'd say, yeah, I don't, I don't know how we um, really found your place. I think it was on Facebook or something along those lines, because clearly somebody had gone onto the website and then given us a call and, and taken the booking. Um, yeah. So sometimes people just don't realize where they've discovered you. Well, uh, I found at Tech Fixies, uh, what will happen is when we do our ads for our free training and we've now got this new brand, brand new social media superhero boot camp, which is coming out at the end of this month. But what we find is when we do an ad, then people tag their friends. And then when we say, how did you hear about us? They actually say they heard about us from their friend, even yes. though it's a Facebook ad. Because once someone's tagging someone, they, it's actually, it's, it becomes a personal recommendation, not an ad to them. Definitely. 100%. And I think with travel as well, you know, that personal recommendation is so important. Um, and, you know, by discovering it via a friend on Facebook or Instagram, it feels personal. And so when Lee J says, when we'd ask people how they found, they kind of go, oh, I'm not sure, maybe like through a friend or Facebook. But we knew because we would be <laughs> running ads and trying to target people. We kind of knew that that's possibly where they'd found us. Yeah. Um, or it was genuine, you know, word of mouth and and that network. So when we got our first uh, review in the Sunday Times, that was genuinely kind of a word of mouth recommendation. It was probably our third ever guest uh, who ha happened to be best friends with one of the luxury travel editors at the Sunday Times. Get in. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you've got to go and, you know, check out this place. It's amazing. And, you know, and that was that was phenomenal for us obviously to get that recognition and covering yeah. such a prestigious kind of publication national publication and of course we went to town in promoting that you know across all of our social media and again channels. social media yeah boosting it out to those people that like well that them. was my that's my question so did you create a like did you take a post and then boost them i mean you're you're part of the face you were part of the facebook yeah. you know employee community so yeah. did you boost them or did you create a custom conversion um well a little bit of both if i'm brutally honest so often i I'd, I'd identified that like um people that enjoy boutique hotels maybe people that travel often in a certain age demographic um within a certain distance of us in the Malvern hills um, because you, you often found that people were prepared to travel three or maximum, say, four hours, much more than that. It's a bit of a long shot, if I'm brutally honest. So um, 
And so I sort of looked at that from an awareness perspective, but often even those awareness ads of just boosting content would result in some kind of um, somebody giving us a call or actually going onto the website and converting. Um, but yes, I also took advantage of the outcome led um, bidding system that the good old Facebook has, which is obviously converting. Um, yeah, we, we, yeah. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Facebook ads, uh, part of our program, we have a Facebook ads workshop, which is run by our Facebook ads manager. And she clarifies a bit of the difference between boosting and custom conversions and then sales, you know, sales conversions, because there are there are nuances, right? You know, um, boosting can work, but also you don't necessarily know that the result is directly tied back to the ad, even though you can look at the analytics and kind of tell. And of course, with the, all the iOS changes, that's going to be interesting to be able to track the conversions etc um yeah. so but but what i'm what i'm also curious about is the kind of budget you use i love the i love your recommendation in terms of the local area obviously mm -hmm. if you're in a in a destination like italy you would have had a different strategy because mm -hmm. you would have been targeting people in the uk that would have wanted to travel to italy probably or even outside of the uk but so maybe touch on that how you might have marketed the italian property if you'd gone that way yeah. but also i think just touch on the budget, uh, and if you if you're willing uh, yeah. to kind of you know was it was it were you doing a small amount on a regular basis or even a large amount? But was it a regular? Was it were you feeding Facebook regularly with the ads or were you kind of on and off with them? A little bit hit and miss to be brutally honest with you. It depended upon how many bookings that we had got, how much visibility and so on. I mean, we were very lucky, particularly in the latter days, where we almost had six months ahead of ourselves of bookings, for absolutely chocker. So um, I didn't necessarily need to, but actually now and again, I perhaps would spend £25 here or £50 there, um, just boosting, just to keep a little bit of awareness out so that you could keep the um, the machine, the beast, um, sort of going, so to speak. Um, yeah, um, because obviously everybody that runs any kind of accommodation business, if you can get at least six months worth of visibility on your guests, then even better. Um, I think my advice would be here is to, um, you first of all have to work out what, what feels like a good amount for you. So if I get a whole house booking, um, and let's say it's two and a half thousand pounds for a weekend, then obviously I need to work out, do I mind spending two, for every 250 pounds? I'm making these up, but 250 pounds, for every 250 pounds I spend on Facebook and Instagram, do I get one two and a half thousand pound booking? So a 10% uh, there. If that feels okay to me, then I've got good return on my investment on those platforms. Um, and that's kind of the way that I looked at it. Equally, if I was having one booking for one room, which was £500, obviously I wouldn't want it using the same 10% approach. I wouldn't really want to spend more than £50. Um, I also sort of looked at it in terms of how many people have I reached with my £10 or £25, you know, and then how many people could I have reached, could I have maxed out? Now, obviously, for any accommodation, unless you're a big hotel with lots of budget, you're never probably going to max out your um, audience. That said, when you do sort of say, actually, I just want 49 year olds that have got a birthday, a 50th birthday coming up, obviously, your, your audience really does start to narrow down. So uh, varying different approaches, but you know, back to my friends, uh, Paul and Aggie over in Levy at this moment in time, uh, of course they've got no UK guests coming over because nobody can travel. Um, they've got this kind of beautiful sauna uh, hot tub set up and they're basically marketing to people that are within an hour's drive of Levy that have again, a special occasion coming up. Um, and they're doing, uh, and, and they're doing that with 25, pounds here 25 pound there and it's working beautifully for them that's great and i love the um i love the idea of giving yourself like a 10 percent. you know that's i would spend 10 percent of what i would make on marketing i think or on ads really i think that's that's important and you know the interesting thing about exploring social social media ads you know instagram and facebook uh, and even pinterest now that we know that pinterest is on the rise with the ads is 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 that is the exposure to more people and it's really interesting because um you know we we've been involved in events where you know we've paid to be involved in the event and our exposure's been so much less than if we just put up a facebook ad and i think you know that it's about that exposure and awareness and you know it, there's nothing 
better than when you speak to someone and they say, oh, I've heard of you. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, yep, because I've been blasting my ads out there. Um, <laughs> But it's that subconscious kind of awareness. And, uh, you know, it's that old uh, age old adage, you know, the seven times that, you know, you got someone's got to see you seven times before they make a decision. Um, and, and it's true. You know, they, they people need to know, like and trust you. And they don't do that after the first time they hear about you. Sometimes they do. You know, yeah. like you said, sometimes they'll see that ad and they're like, oh, this is exactly what I was looking for. We yeah. have a we have, go. Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say we have another student who um, went through our social media supercharge. This was our free program that we ran during the pandemic to help people, you know, just get some free social media skills under their belt. And she was a she was a I think she was a head teacher uh, and she was she was kind of ready to move on from that position. She wanted to kind of do something different. And in our program, she similar to you, she had this dream, this vision of setting up uh, this. Uh, it, it, it's like a farm and there's lots of animals. And anyway, I spoke to her recently and she's got about 20 or 30 animals now, you know, between llamas and horses and, you know, she's doing rescue horses and now she's doing animal therapy and she's got, you know, she's got miniature goats and she's got, you know, cats and she's got chickens and the chickens are right outside the camping pods and, and they, you know, they, they, they lay your egg that you then eat that morning for breakfast. It's like the best egg you've ever had. So, you know, these experience, that's what it is, right? It's an experience. And if you can provide a wonderful experience for people, um, but, but what she did was she did the same thing you guys did. She put up a, uh, she she took some of her best social media posts on Instagram and then put a little boost, bit of boosting money behind it. And she said she got bookings, you know, just straight from the just straight from the boosting and awareness ads. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I agree. I think there's, there's a couple of other things that we perhaps haven't touched on. And, and there's a gift that I will give to your listeners. Um, you know, you, we're all kind of experts because we've got the good old mobile phone, right? So all of a sudden we are all of a sudden photographers and videographers. And even if you don't think that you are, um, if you have a, an Apple phone, I would thoroughly recommend you testing out the portrait mode. It makes your photos beautifully better, but just play around and, and go around your home, go around your environment, take snaps here and there, because you know, the more of that that you can do, the better um, and start just getting used to the tools of Facebook and Instagram. And um, you'll soon know what kind of resonates and what doesn't. But um, portrait mode, particularly on the iPhone, is a fantastic. It makes your photos look beautiful if you haven't. That is so true. I love portrait mode. Uh, and that's where it, it like blurs out the background and focuses in on something. Yeah, I've done some really beautiful pictures with my children with that. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. worth doing. And I think so creative. Um, don't the uh, and, and then the the other thing I'd sort of say is don't ever feel that you need to feed the beast. Like if you haven't posted for a week or two, because um, I talk to people often, they're like, God, I just need to keep doing it on a Wednesday and a Friday and a, and at this time and all the all those other things. Now I'm sure potentially if you've got lots and lots and lots of content. And sorry, Joy, I hope this. I don't know. I don't know whether you're. Um, but, oh, you're treading like so, so my own dodgy ground here. But you know, here's, what I, we, here's what we teach. We we teach yeah. we teach that you should pre-schedule your post. Okay. Uh, and we encourage students to pre-schedule two to four weeks in advance. Okay. And that is so that they don't have to worry about doing both, you know, like yeah. juggling the property. And, and what we do is we say set aside a, a, either a, a, in the beginning, just set aside one half day or one day a week, get everything scheduled. And, you know, and, and then you have four more days to do all the other stuff. Right. Yeah. If you're the one doing it. Um, but I I get what you're saying. The, the one thing we found when just from our company was whenever we had holidays, we would like the whole company would shut down and we would just stop doing social media for like two weeks. It was like such a hard slog to get like all the engagement back up again. So what we just started doing was during the holidays, um, we just, we just would pre-schedule all the posts and then every couple of days go in and reply to people. And it just kept it, just, like you said, feed the beast, but it just kept the engagement because as soon as you stop posting, the engagement drops off and that's what takes forever to build back up again because you only get your stuff organically seen by a small percentage of people. Um, so, you know, that's my own, that's what, that's what we did. But I, I know what you're saying, like, don't beat yourself up if you haven't posted every day. Yeah, I mean, yeah it was, it was honestly such a source of stress because we were juggling everything and I'd be like, oh God, like I haven't posted. And you know, my husband works at Facebook and like, I really ought to be like posting more. Yeah. <laughs> 
And um, it was like, we should have got our chisel together and, and really kind of had a posting strategy. So your tips and tricks are absolutely spot on. Yeah. And I'd or say- Or you just that, hire a tech pixie, right? Like that's what- exactly. Exactly. We, should, we really should have done that. We should have. Uh, um, but, but I like your tips there. I do like your tips they, there, the yeah. scheduling, because it takes 100%. that sort of, it is kind of, it is stressful. Um, but I mean, look, the reality is, is if you don't post on Friday, um, I doubt you're going to see one of the one of your community, or you're not going to hear from your community in uproar on Saturday. Going, I haven't seen you. Where's no, your? You never will hear that. You know what I mean? It's sort of. Yeah. So from that perspective, um, please don't anybody kind of beat yourselves up about it. I think more considered, less is more, more impactful. Really think about your time. We've all only got 24 hours in one day, right? I mean, it may change in my son's lifetime, I don't know, um, with all the technology and, and so on, but time is precious. So just use it wisely in the most wise way uh, possible. And I would sort of advocate that because yeah. these things can become very stressful mm -hmm. and take your hints and tips and you're talking there about things like pixel and boosting and, and so on. And if you can take some of that to make actually what you're doing, is this the best use of your time to bring in new customers or guests call them what you will um in the right way yeah. and then i'd say when you have got them there really nurture that community so we really did over invest in responding to every single post yeah. engaging with everybody when they wrote something and then you'd have that ongoing dialogue and we found that we had a really high percentage of people that would come back return guests repeat bookings and that's because we continue to nurture that community. And that's, again, I think where Facebook, Instagram, social media, you can do that. Um, and it's so important when you're, you know, running a hospitality business because you kind of want those returning guests. again. And yeah. Again. And actually, I mean, a returning guest, you know, the lifetime value of a returning guest is much higher than just those one off guests, which is why it's so important to take care of the people that come into your community. I mean, I've always said organic social media is about community. Paid social media is about getting new leads into that community, right? So, you know, really your organic strategy is about what, what you said, no comment left behind. You know, that's what we teach here. Always reply to everyone. And it's such a, it's such a simple concept, you know, the no comment left behind but it is such a mega concept because that is the difference between an engaging social media account and an, and an unengaged social media account. You know, just think about it this way. Like if you called your friend every day and she never called you back for a week, she's probably, you know, you're probably, well, either she's ignoring you. Well, which is why that, you know, like if, if I call my friend every day for a week and then she never answers, I'm going to stop calling her. Right. She doesn't want to hear from me. So yeah. that's what happens with, it's the same thing with commenting on posts. If people comment on your posts and you don't comment back, you're you're setting yourself up for yeah. them not coming back and and actually we know the cost of getting a new customer is much higher think about that if you have a 500 pound you know expenditure for for two nights for example and you spend 50 pounds to get them in well if you don't do a good job of nurturing that relationship you're just going to have to keep spending 50 pounds 50 pounds 50 pounds to get more people or you can take that 500 pound customer and then they come back every year and for 10 years, you've turned a 500 pound customer into a 5,000 pound customer. It's such an important concept there. So I love that you um, touched on that. Yeah, I think you just need to write, uh, work out what's right for you in that spend to get back that booking or sale, call it what you will. So um, I obviously, as you know, work with lots and lots of businesses. Some business will be like, well, we're a high margin business. So we're happy to spend 50, 60, 70% of the sale value on marketing because of lifetime value, which is ultimately what you're talking about there, isn't it? Um, and that I, um, so yeah, you just need to work out what's right for you. No, I think you're, I think you're right on that. Well, I've taken a lot of your time. Um, yeah, obviously right. we've not talked a lot about the pandemic. Uh, you guys ended up making a decision for a lifestyle change for your family. Uh, and, and so you're, you're no longer running this. Um, but of course, you're connected to people in the industry. How have your friends uh, managed the pandemic? And do you have any tips for people who are going to be coming out of, you know, they've been on this holding pattern for a year waiting for people to be able to use their Airbnbs? What tips do you have for them? Um, yeah, a hundred percent. So, so I'm consulting and working with lots of brands in the hospitality space, and it's been a brutal year for them. Really, really tough. 
Um, I'd say, you know, what I have been saying, continue to nurture your community. You know, when you can open again, they will come back, but they need to know you're still there. Um, so don't stop. And I think, you know, a lot of brands have been brilliant at sort of thinking about how they can still connect with their consumers, whether that's kind of offering virtual events, um, just continuing to post and engage, share pictures so that people are dreaming right now about going away and, and having a break. So posting imagery about what they can get to when we can get there is still really, really powerful. And when that you know they're able to book, you want to make sure that you're front of mind. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, now more than ever, just, it, yeah, nurturing that community, understanding who your audience are, being ready with open arms when they can come back. Mm. I don't know whether you've got any uh, other... Yeah, I think, I, I think I'd just add, stay as positive as you can. Um, we're all coming out the other side of this. And I, I truly believe this last 12 months, every individual has probably had a, uh, a, a lot of time to reflect and sort of, think okay be more purposeful in life and appreciative and I think the hospitality the food sector uh, people will appreciate those experiences more so there's definitely and we're seeing it already of course in the news there's definitely the desire to go out to the restaurants to go and stay at places um, so right at this moment in time as Amanda says think about your proposition, refine it whilst you haven't got anybody there. Cause trust me, by the time the doors start opening, you have, you're not gonna have a second yeah. um, post as much as you can, you can and keep connected. And that's um, a great point. Maybe now is a really good time to get your pre-scheduled strategy off of the yeah. ground so that yeah. when you're flooded with customers, cause we all wanna go on holiday desperately that you are, um, you've got the, you've got that running in the background already. Cause uh, one of the tips that one of our social media coaches, um, Sophie Bradley gives, she's one of our Instagram coaches. She always gives the, uh, the tip that you should stockpile your images. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't take a picture just for the purpose of social media at that moment, but actually take photos all the time as you're going around. Number one, you'll become a better photographer. Uh, but number two, you then have a stock of photos from all year round that you can tap into. No one knows that it was last year's photo, not this year's photo. As long as there's snow on the ground, you know, it's winter or as long as there's a, a flower coming out, it's spring. So you have the opportunity there to to kind of reuse imagery. And if you're taking it all the time, that also gives you a stockpile of images to use later. And I, I, I've always loved that tip. It's Definitely. great, great advice. Great yeah, advice. it's a great opportunity now just to kind of get your house in order, get all of that stuff that you don't normally get to do done. You know, as you say, kept capturing more content, scheduling posts, testing other platforms that you may not have had an opportunity to have a play around with, you know. Well, Rosalind this. here says she wants to go on holiday. I think we're making everybody yeah. jealous right now. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so how about that? I'd love to know. So where are you guys going to go on your first uh, holiday? Was it, are you going to try and go out of the UK? Are you going to try and stay within the UK? Yeah, well, we had we had somewhere booked for St. Ives um, that I think I was probably a little bit keen for uh, that, uh, you know, back end of. Um, yeah, back end. But, but funnily enough, if we can get away in July, we're actually going to Italy, back, back to where it all began, the yeah. dream, where we were first inspired. Because I think throughout this whole journey, I think we all are in need of that inspiration again. And so, yeah, hopefully, if we can get there, we're going to go back to Italy. And we'll yeah, take we're, we're desperately trying to do the same thing. I haven't seen my parents in two years. So, because uh, because I was in America, the last time I was in America was the end of 2000. Well, it was like the autumn of 2019. So, you know, by the time this autumn rolls around, it'll be two full years, which I've never gone that long. I don't think, I think prior to this lockdown, I had gone eight months without seeing my parents. And that was when I was an exchange student in France when I was 15 years old. So, you know, just to, to go that long without seeing your family is, is huge. And I know a lot of people in the UK are, have had to go without seeing their family and they can drive to their parents' houses and that, you know, I can't you know get on a plane. So it's the same no matter where you are, but we're trying to do the same thing because uh, we want, we want to, we're trying to meet in Italy. That's what we're, that's what we're hoping for. But of course, my husband's a huge fan of staycations. And very often when, when I've had visa issues, we've been kind of 
uh, we've had to stay here and we've gone and visited Scotland and Wales and uh, you know, we've yet to do um, Northern Ireland or Ireland, but uh, we've, you know, we've really been able to explore Cornwall as well. And, you know, and the New Forest and um, the Yorkshire Dales and, you know, there's so much to explore in the UK. It's so beautiful here. And that's absolutely true. I think this is a great opportunity for us all to really embrace the environment and the country that we live in, to be honest. I think that is a huge positive. Uh, and, uh, and and even listening to you talk there, you'll be more appreciative when we do get the opportunity to do that. So, you know, the anybody that's uh, running their own accommodation mm -hmm. business or um, food business, um, restaurant, pub, whatever, you know, people are going to be really embrace, I think, and, and grateful for um, creating those memories again. Well, here's hoping we all get our vaccines soon. I'm not quite old enough, and I doubt you guys are either, but we're going to get there eventually. Um, <laughs> Rosemary says, great to hear your story. Uh, I want to thank you both very much for your time today and all of your tips and advice. You've been very generous talking about your story, the ups, the downs, the, the good stuff, the bad stuff, but really what you've touched on uh, more importantly than anything is vision, knowing your customer, over delivering, providing a great service. Don't forget to ask for recommendations because that creates repeat customers. And, you know, and then also just, I love this concept of just creating a beautiful space, you know, and you can see that you guys have carried that into your own personal life, but creating a beautiful space that gives people that, that break that they want. Um, and, and knowing, you know, knowing who that person is. And also you gave us some great tips as well on social media, you know, no comment left behind, which reiterates what we do. We've had a great discussion about pre-scheduling and also about boosting and awareness ads to just get the word out there about what you're doing. And I loved your tip around keeping it local, especially for the UK um, audience, because that's people will drive, you know, three to four hours to get there. So thank you so much. That was a, that was a, a tip filled podcast. <laughs> and I know we've got, I mean, Golly, they there. We have some tech pixies who have been waiting for this interview for a long time. I know I'm going to get a lot of positive feedback about this. So um, thank you so, thank so you. much. I've loved it. It's yeah. been great. Thank very, you so very much. Very kind. And, uh, and you know, anybody feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Yeah, um, really happy to help. Any tips? Get in touch with us. We're on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. And Kara, and we'll close on Carolyn's thoughts. Staycations will help hospitality recover and so many beautiful places to visit yeah. for a day or longer. Gordana says, great interview. Uh, okay. And let me just take the banner off here so people can see, oops, that's the wrong one. Oh, that's the wrong one. Let me just remove the banner somehow. There we go. So Lee J and Miranda Burningham, you can find them on LinkedIn and connect with them. Uh, and again, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thanks, it's great to, great to see you all. <laughs>